muted. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I'd like, you to, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Shaping Up Your Motivational Interviewing Skills, featuring Dr. Kate Speck. At this time, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items for today's webinar. We'd like to encourage you all to participate in today's webinar via three methods. First, if you have any questions for Kate or are experiencing any technical issues, please use the chat box or the questions pane to submit any of your questions. I will be bringing up any questions as they come in directly to Kate. Throughout the webinar, all participants will be on mute. If for any reason you would like to be unmuted, please click the raise your hand request and unmute your personal phone or mic. I, as the organizer, will then unmute you to speak directly onto the webinar. You are also able to collapse and expand the GoToWebinar panel via the arrow button should you choose. One hour following today's webinar, you're going to receive the evaluation and continuing education request information. This webinar is approved for one PCB and or NADAC credit. You can also request a general certificate of attendance. I will go over all of this again at the conclusion of today's webinar. Next question is, what is your current professional role? Are you a counselor, therapist, social worker, or case manager? Are you a nurse? nurse practitioner, physician or physician assistant, a program or unit administrator, a university student or faculty, or other. And you can feel free to submit to the questions panel or the chat box uh, description if you selected other. Okay, I want to thank everyone for completing that poll. I'm just going to share the results with you. Okay, for our next poll question, which field do you currently represent? Mental health, addiction, physical health, education, or EAP? And if none of those apply to you, again, feel free to submit to the questions box. As well, I'd just like to read off a couple of the responses that have come into the questions panel. We have someone who is a research staff, state government worker, a peer specialist, an OWI assessor, a CADHCS analyst, probation officers, um, someone who works in housing and employment, homeless services, uh, someone who works for a nonprofit at CBO, school-based health centers, and integrated behavioral health. And one more, uh, working with homeless families. And for our third poll, do you currently conduct expert interventions? Okay, I want to thank everyone for participating in that poll, and I'll go ahead and share those results as well can see that the majority of the attendees do not currently conduct expert interventions. And for our last poll, do you see your agency using expert? I want to thank everyone for participating in that final poll as well. I'm going to share those last results. We can see that the majority of attendees do see their agency using SBIRT. Now, at this time, I would like to introduce our presenter for today. Kate Speck is with the University of Nebraska Public Policy Center. She has developed and directed treatment programs in three states, taught addiction at post-secondary level, instructional supervision, suicide prevention, psychological first aid and ethics, and as a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, or MINT. She provides training and coaching nationally in behavioral health, case management, probation, and healthcare venues. Now, at this time, Kate, if you're ready to go, I can hand things over to you.
want to thank Sarah for her great uh, leadership and working with me on this and uh, all three of her staff. I'm very pleased to talk about motivational interviewing. So we'll get right into it and uh, I may have to do um, a little quick talk because we've missed a little bit of time. So again, thank you for your patience. So our learning objectives today, again, as you can read here, we want to talk a little bit more about those advanced uh, strategies. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the four processes of motivational interviewing, as you can see there. And what I'm hoping to help you do is to evaluate a little bit your own personal skills and the usefulness of motivational interviewing in your own uh, clinical practice. So uh, when we talk about shaping up your skills here, a lot of people have had the introductory uh, uh, and advanced courses. Uh, they have worked with that. But again, I think a lot of times as the technology of motivational interviewing has advanced over the years in terms of research, we're just learning more and more about what it is and how it's helping people make some changes. So again, we have a lot of application. And if you take a look at all of these, we know that the Dictions was the first application uh, if you will, of MI, but again, you can look and see all of these different groups that are using it uh, in, a, in a way that is then beneficial, and we continue to do research on that. And that's again why those brief interventions with SBIRT have been something that have worked really well. Uh, and so what we want to do today is go a little bit beyond the basics and uh, take a look at enhancing our conversations about change and let's listen to these four processes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those four processes. Again, looking at how do we successfully integrate motivational interviewing toward a strategic focus. I want to focus a little bit on that. I'll review some of the strategies uh, that we work with with ambivalence. Um, and, and you know, ambivalence comes up in a lot of different ways. But typically, it'll come up with goal conflicts. You know, what is our goal? What is the goal of the client or the patient? Um, evoking change talk, uh, that's an important uh, strategy that we use. As well, again, how do we get stuck ourselves? What is it that you know stops us from moving ahead in our own ability to do this well? And I'll talk a little bit about agenda setting and focusing on change talk, especially when we have sustained talk that is kind of happening at the same time. So that's just basically what we want to look at um, today. Uh, these particular um, icons are things that uh, I often talk about in training. So I'm sure every one of you are very well aware of the ORs and you know open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. We don't need to go over that. The readiness ruler using a scaling technique um, to help people kind of determine what is their readiness for, for, um, for changing, what is their importance level or confidence level regarding change. Um, the darn cat, which is thinking about readiness language, desire, ability, reason, need, and then commitment, as well as action and taking steps toward action. And then you can see here this uh, MI3, we've got this four circles here, the new content in training with motivational interviewing. Three is kind of that, the new way we're thinking about spirit and how spirit can be um, the biggest part of MI, of course. But we've added that issue of compassion uh, that was this different uh, since, since some of the research um, is telling us that that's an important component. And then I've got those, all those circles there talking about synergy. And synergy, of course, means that not only are we we're, we're putting all this stuff together, we're, we're putting it all together to, to make a focus, which is why I have the target on there. And that target, of course, is we have to be focused on some kind of a target when we're using motivational interviewing. So it's not just that we're having a conversation. We're having a specific conversation about change. So the eight stages of learning motivational interviewing, this came out in about 2006. And so many of us were thrilled to have kind of a, just something to think about uh, when, we're getting, when, we're, when we're teaching motivational interviewing. So as you can see, there's eight components here. And the spirit using our, our, our micro skills, if you will, recognizing change talk. And then number four, beyond recognizing change talk, eliciting and reinforcing it, which um, now we've kind of called chasing change talk, because you're going to go after it. Um, rolling with resistance, 
of course, we, we know that motivational interviewing is a terrific uh, intervention with people who are not thinking about change and to kind of get them in that vein where, we, where they do think about change. Um, developing a change plan, an important component. And without really, I mean, if you don't have a change plan in mind, if there's nothing there, then you've just had a conversation with really no end. And so that change plan is a really important part of where we want to get to uh, when it comes to using MI. Uh, and then, of course, that all part of that is, is coming up with consolidating client commitment. So the commitment that they uh, portray, as well as we talk with them about that, um, getting that together and helping the client start on that path. And then, of course, using motivational interviewing with other methods. And so many other methods are being tested. Uh, and we've got good evidence that says that it is a, a, a good add-on, if you will. It's good by itself. It's a good add-on in other areas. So important for us to think about are these eight stages of learning. And I'm going to spend a little more time here because I think it's also important for us to kind of understand what motivational interviewing is not. And uh, some time ago, uh, Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick um, published another article called The Ten Things That Motivational Interviewing Is Not. And that was, that was when motivational interviewing was about 25 years old. So thinking about that, we want to make sure that we're not connecting it with um, or stating that it's part of the trans-theoretical model or the stages of change. We do use the stages of change in thinking about our interventions and what interventions are appropriate for each stage of change. Uh, and so that's where the connection for um, stages of change are. Again, it's not a way of telling people or getting them to do what we want them to do. Uh, I, I hear people say th sometimes, oh, I am I that client. And that's really not the orientation that we want to portray. It's not like we're doing something to them to get them to do what we want. Um, not a technique. So motivational interviewing is not a technique. It's considerably more than that. And it's more understood as a method of communication. Again, it's a complex skill that we learn about, thinking about intrinsic and extrinsic change. And it's best described as a guiding style for enhancing motivation about change. And lots of times, again, it's put together in a structured format, but uh, again, not just this technique that we're using to, to um, confuse it with any other specific technique. Now, decisional balance is another uh, area that we often use to have a motivational interviewing conversation with. And it's not just that decisional balance piece, the pros and cons of what a person is doing, looking at status quo and change. But it's more beyond that. It's really, again, we're going to get to, hopefully, that plan for change. Uh, motivational interviewing does not require assessment feedback. So you don't have to have an assessment that you're using to provide a motivational interviewing session. Now, this is something we do with SBIRT, of course, because uh, in SBIRT, it's that feedback about the person's uh, current status with alcohol or drugs that are important here. So that assessment feedback is really important in our SBIRT interventions. Not a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. A good add-on, of course, but not necessarily. Uh, it, it's, it is not a cognitive, it's not a cognitive therapy like behavioral cognitive, but it is about change and about, again, the person thinking about their own belief system and us tapping into that. It's not just client-centered counseling either. So we're all very familiar with those traditional concepts of client-centered counseling. You, many people are calling it patient-centered counseling, those kinds of things. Again, it's more than that because it's going toward that specific goal. To say that motivational interviewing is easy uh, is another thing that we'd like to kind of think about. It's simple. There's some simple concepts, but it's like learning to play an instrument or go to, you know, learn about a sport. You really usually need a coach. And typically we say that motivational interviewing, and to be proficient in it, is really important for us to develop um, 
uh, through more than just self-study or more than just attending workshops. But typically with practice and feedback and coaching is uh, where people's proficiency really soars. Uh, usually motivational interviewing is not what somebody's already doing. Uh, and oftentimes people say, well, yeah, I motivate my clients. Well, it's more than that piece. So we, we do know that many people recognize motivation interviewing when they first hear it, they first see it, and that guiding style provides some flexibility. Um, so it's, it's, it's a familiar thing to help and have empathy, but we want to do that plus we want to get somewhere. So it's a very focused um, intervention. And then I think the last thing to talk about here is, is that we know that motivational interviewing is not the only thing um, that is out there. Um, it's not a panacea. Uh, it was never meant to do that. Uh, it is a particular tool to address a specific problem. So when a person needs to make a behavior change, a lifestyle change, they're struggling with ambivalence about what should they do, um, it's moving that person um, to address that. But it's not intended to address all situations and all problems that are presented to us in the health, behavioral health or uh, any other world. We kind of all have to think about that people who are already in the change process really don't need motivational interviewing. So uh, if they're ready, uh, we, we don't want to get in their way. If they're not, we want to do something to help build that motivation. So where we can get stuck, uh, there's we have a nice list here of talking about and letting go of our expert role. And sometimes that's kind of hard to do. Uh, because we have expertise, and it's not that we're suggesting that we let go of that expertise, but yet we let the client guide us in their uh, area of where they're looking for, for change. Um, using complex reflections. This is a very, um, I think, strategic way of going about the conversations about change. So we see a lot of people get stuck in the reflection area because they're not really listening to the intent of the conversation, moving it beyond. And, and also, our complex reflections should help our clients move along, not just in what they said, but we should be adding information or challenges to the client to consider when it comes to the change process itself. Missing opportunities to use motivational interviewing. Well, I think that can happen. Again, we don't want to just stand on the sidelines. Um, of course, we know that it's based on those non-directive counseling skills. Um, however, we, we want those reflective statements uh, to be more than just listening. We want them to stand out and uh, uh, draw out change talk for our clients. Uh, giving insufficient direction. Now, oftentimes people will say, well, uh, they, my client doesn't want to go anywhere. Well, we do need to have a direction in mind. And, and have a discussion about that direction with the client. Uh, and, and trying to operationalize, if you will, this change talk area uh, with the client. Opposing resistance. Well, uh, that can be a particular trap for people uh, because at some point along the line, we might just get frustrated. Uh, in our own humanness, whether we realize it or not, we might start to feel that conflict or that conflict might be, be um, start to be part of the picture with our client. And we sometimes can get trapped in that without realizing what's happening uh, in that situation with the resistance. So just really being aware of that and, and our, our own opposition to think about or uh, listen to what the client has to say about their position. Um, not moving along to phase two, which otherwise we call enhancing, which is enhancing motivation. Uh, again, we use motivational interviewing to get to a particular target and to help that person sort through the change that they want to make in their behaviors. Not attending to commitment language. Uh, we don't want to miss that. Uh, again, that also can be with missed opportunities. Uh, so we want to attend to that commitment language when a person has made a commitment. And maybe it's not about the specific topic that we're talking about, but even having a conversation with the client about the commitment that they may have had in another area and how that particular 
commitment can help us learn about how we might be able to transfer that information or learning to this particular problem or area. And then not letting go of motivational interviewing. So what I mean by that is that uh, there's a time and place for it. Uh, there's a couple of areas, and I'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, but again, we want to think about where does motivational interviewing fit best. We know definitely early stages and engagement. We know that the data say to us that it's about engagement, and it's also about retention. And those are two elements that come up consistently in our research, uh, uh, looking at keeping the client in that engagement place and also retaining them in the stress, retaining them in treatment of some type. So, Kate, I'd love to interrupt you and just give you one question that has come in here. Okay. Um, the question is, is MI for everyone? Is it a one size fits all? Thank you. I don't think it is uh, for everyone. In fact, one of the things I'd like to suggest if people are considering using it is we have a wonderful uh, addiction technology transfer center course on motivational interviewing called the Tour of MI, which is kind of a way for people to determine is motivational interviewing for me or not. It's an online course and it's very well done. And I would suggest if people are thinking about do you even want to do this, that that would be a place for that person to start. Um, like I said, not a panacea. It's not, again, for any, it's not for every situation or problem or for every therapist. And I think it's better to not use something that doesn't fit with your skill level, with your um, particular um, expertise. And so I would say no, I don't think it's for everyone for every situation. We do have one other question and then I have a couple of hand raised hand okay. raised that I'd like to address as well. Um, so the next question is, what are some good ways to get past the resistance? And if you want to just say you can address this later, that's fine as well. Okay, yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, I think. Um, and again, those are all kinds of things that we do in our introductory workshops about, you know, talking about how we get past those conversations about change. We use our, our um, micro skills of ORs, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you have a couple uh, of hand raises. Yeah, let's. I just let we can address two of them right now. Uh, so sure. Jennifer Frey, I'm going to unmute you. If you want to unmute your personal mic, feel free to voice your question live. Um, if you don't have a question and your hand raised was by accident, you can just let us know that. Okay, looks like she might have put her hand back down, so we'll try one more here. Uh, Seth Forwood, I'm going to unmute you as well. If, if you have a question, feel free to voice that live. Okay, now some of these questions might have come in when we were having some audio issues, so I'm going to go ahead and lower everyone's hand. If you do have a question that you'd like to ask live on the webinar, feel free to use the raise your hand button again. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. No problem. All right. So I've moved us to the next slide, and uh, we talk about the core principles of motivational interviewing, and, and one thing I think is really helpful for us is the third edition of the book itself. Uh, and third edition has a lot of uh, great information in it. It's very user friendly. And uh, the other thing is that uh, this tour of MI that I was talking about earlier uh, has to do with, you know, how do I help people get on the road to change? How do I kind of address their resistance when they're not responding to me? So we talk a lot about that as resistance as a psychological need to protect the person uh, and, and, they, and why their defenses are up so high. And I think we need to examine our own areas and what we're doing to see if we may be adding to any of that conflict by taking an opposing stance against what the client is really trying to say or not listening. So again, this whole idea of being on the journey with the client and is a, a kind of a powerful piece of them joining, joining with them uh, with the spirit of motivational interviewing. So now we have a poll question, 
and we're going to look at that poll question. So, Sarah, do you want to go ahead and initiate that poll? Sure thing. Okay, so this first question is asking about uh, motivational interviewing, the third edition. Have you, did you know about it? Do you have it on your list to read? Have you read some of it, or do you sit it under your pillow? All right, I want to thank everyone for participating in that poll. I'm just going to go ahead and share those results. Uh, so 49% of the audience said they didn't even know about 1 and 2. 29% said they have it on their list to read. 16% said I have some of it. And 5% said I sleep with it under my pillow. I hope that makes for a very comfortable pillow for you. <laughs> well, it's, uh, yeah, I often call that 5% drinking the Kool-Aid. We drank the Kool-Aid. So, thank you everyone. All right. Th thank you, Sarah. All right. So, moving on here, I'm going to try to advance my slide here. There we go. Uh, so, um, the underlying spirit of motivational interviewing is, is very well described in MI3. And I would encourage people to think about it, read it, um, and try to understand where the spirit might come in in terms of really helping um, ourselves move through that process of change with the person. So this configuration here talks about the, the collaboration that we need to have, where we are accepting our client, you know, where they're at. I mean, I know people say that, the words. But this is a sense of really accepting it and accepting the struggle that they are presenting us when we're having these conversations about change. Can't have a conversation without evocation and asking questions, reflections, summaries, etc. So those are all important for the evo you know, evoking from the client what their thoughts are, how those clients are um, responding to the problem how it's been operationalized in their life. So lots of questions, um, but we, we talk about questions and the difference between lots of questions versus really good, good questions. So when we're pumping up or shaping up our MI skills, we really want to think about what are the questions we're asking, how are we asking them, are they getting us anywhere? Or are we simply asking questions for the sole purpose of asking the question because we don't know what else to do. The last one to talk about here is compassion. And when we think about the issue of compassion, that is, uh, in a sense, again, of it's, it's my wish, you know, my desire to really work with that person to solve uh, the, the issue of whatever is going on. You know, people have intrinsic motivation. You know, I'm, in, I'm motivated from the inside. I want to do something. But often we see folks who may have a little bit of pushback. And I'm not using the term resistance so much anymore. I use the term pushback or reluctance or lack of readiness simply because I think it's less judgmental on the client uh, from my perspective. I, I try to watch my words as much as I can so that I can think about it in that way. So we want to you know, think about resistance as maybe a psychological dilemma that the, the client is experiencing and is having um, a difficulty, a difficult time uh, uh, giving up in the sense. So, the four foundational processes then are also outlined in the MI3 book. And I love it because it's so much simpler to kind of think about. We talk about the core principles, so they're still there. All that basic stuff is still there, but the issue of, of these four processes kind of giving us a nice guideline. What are we doing when we're doing motivational interviewing? When we're practicing it, what's really happening in the conversation? So engaging is establishing that positive, helpful connection and working relationship. That's the basis of the spirit, if you will. The next one is really focusing. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about that focusing in, uh, here, uh, about the target behavior. Um, and again, developing and maintaining conversation that goes in a specific direction. And here's where we talk about understanding where the difference between change talk versus sustained talk. And when those things can both come out of a conversational statement that the, the client has made, how do we hang out with change talk and not hang out with sustained talk? So the evoking piece then is eliciting or evoking from the, the client what are their, what's their readiness for change? What direction would they like to go? Um, where have they gone in the past? Um, why has that not been something that they've stuck with, if you will? So lots of different types of questions and things about pumping up our, our skills related to this, how, how do we ask a question? How do we ask a question in a specific direction? So these are the things that we want to do as we're um, getting more skill in our, in our motivational interviewing. And then the planning piece, talked a little bit about that, and that is that whole developing commitment. So the change plan is part of that. And getting the change plan in place and then helping the client move to the place where um, they, they can take some steps toward that commitment. Uh, that may not necessarily say, oh, yeah, I'm going to totally give up tobacco, totally. Uh, but maybe they want to, and at the same time, they can't figure out a way about planning around that dilemma and helping the client plan around that dilemma as well. So the education piece, I want to talk a little bit about what's unique to motivational interviewing. So the uniqueness comes about when we talk about the intentional and differential attention to this change talk. Really going with it and, and making sure that that's the path that the client wants to go down the road with. Now, one of the things we have to think about with change talk and sustained talk is, like I said before, the instances that people have both of those things in one statement. How do you not pay attention to both of those? And if you have a client who's ambivalent and your patient is not moving ahead with their um, health goals um, because they have ambivalence about it or they just don't believe it's going to work for them, it's really important for us to kind of separate out where those, you know, where those dichotomies are. Uh, why do they fall on one side or the other and what is this ambivalence doing to them? So in evocation, what we're doing is we're trying to draw out their thoughts and ideas. Uh, what, what, what do they think about this? And, it's, and it goes beyond just what do they think about it. What's your attitude uh, about it? What have you tried in the past to address this? You know, how, are, how, is, how has that gone for you? Are those are kinds of things to draw out the person. And again, we, we know that you know, from all the research, and I think we probably know from ourselves, if somebody's tried to push us to do something that we don't want to do, we have a little bit of a reaction to that. Now, it depends on how far or how deeply you believe about something. You could have a mild reaction or you could have a pretty significant reaction. And this happens often when um, we're not thinking about that change process going down on the pa same path that the client would like to um, go down. So we know that this questioning, reflections, all the things we're doing in motivational interviewing are really to set the client up for their own self-discovery, to believe in themselves about what they can do for change, and to go ahead and make a decision regarding that. Uh, and so uh, this, the whole idea of, of how we go about that again, is that uniqueness to motivational interviewing. You're just not going to find that in any other therapeutic model. So this intentional or differential evoking and reinforcing of change talk, a strategic or directed use of what we call the client-centered methods. You, can, you may call them consultation. You can call it counseling. You can call it uh, behavior change or case management if you want to. It doesn't matter. We're still using that reflections and summaries to really be strategic about the direction that we're that, that we're going with the client so you're 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 in the process an active process 
as a health care professional or as a counselor, as a case manager, you've got to be kind of quick on your toes doing motivational interviewing to, again, be strategic when it comes to the, the client's uh, thought process. We always have to be thinking about this. And I just say, if you can be curious, it's this curiosity that you have. Not to be curious and ask a lot of questions to solve your own questions, but be curious about what the meaning is for the client. That's the direction that we want to go in. And then this whole sequencing of preparatory change talk, as I mentioned earlier, desire, ability, um, reasons, and need. And of course, you know, we think about the reasons that might be in the person's head, and that's what we're trying to draw out from them. We're, we're talking with them in a conversation about change to discover these areas. And then, of course, the next area that we want to get to is that whole idea of commitment language. So the ingredients for motivational interviewing to actually be useful is, number one, to have a clear target behavior. Where are we going? If we don't have this clear target behavior, you know, as identified by the client, then you might just be having a conversation about change that's not going to go anywhere. And secondarily, this ambivalence about changing, um, or the possibility of building ambivalence, by the way, because that can happen when we start to talk about change. People start to, in their own head, start to think about, oh, I don't know, is this really a good thing? This is not very comfortable for me. So again, what we're trying to do here is wake up that person's mixed feelings about, about the behavior. If they're feeling two ways about it, great. We can have a conversation about that. And just having that conversation really helps to reduce this resistance because you're willing to talk about both sides that this person is struggling with. And just doing that is a form of acceptance accepting the client where they're at, accepting the uh, dilemma that they're presenting to us. So these, these are the kinds of things that we're just, if you want to keep it to the simple area, that's what I would say. Think about clear target behavior and address the ambivalence. Wake up that ambivalence that the person is having. So one of the things we use, and this is just a sample of one, but one of the things we use to kind of try to get find a focus is use this agenda setting chart. And this can be done, and you can just do it with just blank circles on a piece of paper. But this one here would be a sample of what I use when I'm working with maybe somebody who's got some health problems. So for instance, I have several areas that I, would, I think are important when we're looking at health problems. And I've got some open areas because my intention is to get my client maybe fill those in. What would they like to talk about? What's important for them um, to, to make this change? So here I just have, you know, a package of cigarettes. If, if smoking um, is something that the person is doing, I might want to say we can, we can talk about smoking if you'd like. What about maybe the alcohol, which is uh, drinking alcohol? Um, what about taking your medications on a, you know, on a uh, prescribed basis? Is that something that you want to, you know, talk about? Um, healthy diet, exercise, um, man managing your weight. And so those are just some things. Now you can use this with, again, any uh, situation. You just put in your own pictures or have the client, again, maybe you and the client work together to develop this agenda, if you will, about what will we talk about today? What is it that we want to uh, talk about? So we call this, again, finding a focus. So what's the change goal? Um, typically, you can't address all of the things that are going, uh, excuse me, I went the wrong way here. It's really going to be hard for you to address everything that's on this change chart, right? So what we want to do is just pick one or two to start with and get agreement with the client on which ones. And it may not be, you know, it's maybe I'm not so interested in, in um, of the exercise of the diet, I'm a little more interested in helping them reduce their tobacco use. That's kind of what my role is. I'm a tobacco specialist and um, that's what I'm trying to do and I work for a, a program that we want to reduce their tobacco use. I might want to zone in on that as a practitioner right away, but the client is thinking, 
I'm not so sure I want to give that up. So they might say, well, let's, and, I'm, and may, they may say, I want to talk about my weight. So in that instance, instead of talking about the cigarettes where I want to go, I'm going to talk about the, the weight and about managing weight. And at some point in time, I'll be able to uh, bring in the tobacco because the person might be thinking about it. I'm just wondering, and I, I'm just going to be curious here and wonder if your concern about not using tobacco has anything to do with the concern about your weight. I'm going to try to connect those two together and see if that's something that they will, have, will be willing to have a discussion about with me in terms of that change. So that's kind of how I might get to the setting that agenda for them to do and collaborating with the client on what they have deemed important. So that focus or change goal for MI, and then again, we try to get that from the client's agenda. From time to time, you might have somebody come in and say, well, I don't know what I want to change, or I don't know what I, I'm doing here because I just got sent here by my, you know, by somebody, and, and uh, I, don't really have a, I don't really have a goal. That's a difficult situation, and what we want to do in that situation is uh, try to evoke more from the client, and I'm going to give you some steps to do that in a little bit here. Um, but oftentimes it might be prescribed by the context, and that is, if you're an addiction specialist or behavior health change person from one particular area, the client is seeing you because of that. And I think it's better at that time, rather than to just zone in because we are a specialist in one area, to think about what's the context for the client to be there? What's the meaning of the client's uh, being there, sitting, talking to you? So think about the context and, and how that can impact the conversation. And then, of course, sometimes that fight or that internal fight would be that we have to assess on a regular basis, what if my goal is not the same goal that the client wants to achieve? And can I really help this client? So it's kind of maybe our less of lack of comfort, if you will, or sometimes it might be lack of skills as they help the client move along because um, they're not they're not really stating what we want, would like to hear, what we hear most about um, in our line of work. So here's a, a technical definition about how does motivational interviewing work, and I find this to be very instructive for me to think about it and, in, in this way. And it helps me to understand why does motivational interviewing work in so many different venues in so many different areas. And so, again, this collaborative, goal-oriented, again, method of communication. And you, all you really want to think about is I'm having a conversation about change. So with particular attention to the language of change, what is the client saying? We, we have to process that with them. You know, what are they, what are they just uh, made, made uh, a note about? Again, strengthening the individual's motivation for and movement toward that specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own arguments for change. So, you know, that's another thing that we think about when we think about ex expert. Well, where does expert come in? This particular kind of thing, like, for instance, when you're talking with somebody about their excessive use, that's a really important uh, method of communication, talking about that specific goal. Where are we going next? It's in an expert brief intervention, that's really what we're trying to do is talk about the person's excessive use or the, the areas of concern that we might have for, for any of that. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here are some okay. things I think might be helpful for you in terms of just some steps to think about when we're using motivational interviewing. Kate, before we move on, could I ask sure. one, I have one question from an audience sure, member? Absolutely. Sure. So is MI appropriate for one-time meetings with a client, or is it more for an ongoing relationship? For example, this attendee works on a trauma unit in a hospital and only sees most clients once or twice during their stay. Yes. Okay, so I think that it can be both. Uh, and if, you're, uh, if you don't have access, I mean, that's what the brief intervention is really all about. I think you can use it with trauma clients. Again, you, you can adopt a motivational interviewing style. That's, that's a very um, appropriate thing to do. Now, in terms of what are we wanting to utilize or what are we 
trying to accomplish with our trauma client. Um, we've used motivational interviewing very successfully in many studies working with clients who have trauma. It's probably in that sense more of a more on a long-term basis or uh, uh, more appointments than one or two, but you can still have this motivational interviewing style and what you can do is again engage, help them focus, evoke from them what they want to do, and is there any kind of particular plan that they would like to, to follow. One thing you have to be careful with with trauma clients is, again, that pushing them because their defenses are going to be, they've been traumatized, so their defenses are going to be, um, it's going to be like a, a, a lockbox inside of a, a vault, if you will. So once you get one place, it's going to be hard to get the other, a, a next place because they're going to protect themselves as much as they can. Anything else, Sarah? We do have one hand raised that I want to see if this person would like to speak onto the webinar. Okay. Uh, so Maureen, I apologize, I'm going to say your last name incorrectly, Doherty, I'm going to unmute you. If you want to unmute your mic, if you have a question, feel free to speak it now. Maureen, if you have a question, you can feel free to share it. All right, and then we have one other hand raised. We can test this one out. Uh, Mercedes Williams, I'm going to unmute you if you'd like to share your question. All right, and she's put her hand down. So just to remind everyone, you can submit questions to the questions box or the chat box, and if you would like to speak live onto the webinar, just select the raise your hand feature. Uh, you will need to unmute yourself, and I'll unmute you on our end. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so these steps um, I think are very helpful. It kind of keeps things simple. I would not want you to think that this is kind of the recipe to do motivational interviewing. This is a helpful guide or what I call an algorithm that it kind of helps us, you know, what's the intention of the patient or client? So setting the agenda. Again, asking about positive aspects of the behavior, things that, you know, again, that now you might you don't want to do that with a trauma client, right? Not if you're working with a trauma client and you're working with them on their defense mechanisms, you might want to talk about the defense mechanisms and how they protect the person. Um, ask about some of the less good things. What kinds of things would be of a concern um, to that person? Thinking about the person's life goals. Again, are they achieving their life goals? Is this situation getting in the way in any, in any uh, concern that they might have about that? And then you know, making sure we ask for a decision or kind of restate the dilemma that they may be um, portraying to us to find out where they're at. And of course, if they're still feeling two ways about something, we're not going to move ahead until we find a place for them to land because if you push a person who's ambivalent, that's going to give you a lot of pushback. Uh, and that pushback is, um, again, sometimes they don't come back to your therapy. Sometimes they come back, but they don't do what you've asked them to do. So there's a lot of ways that this resistance or this ambivalence can kind of show its ugly head, if you will. And again, I, I tend to think of a person who's ambivalent as a person who, um, I call it the Scarlett O'Hara syndrome, where um, I, you know, I'll think about it tomorrow. But the problem is, is that it often doesn't get tucked away in a nice little envelope, and, and that's the end of it. It's bothering the person. It's in the back of their mind. So I call that the struggle that just kind of keeps coming up for them, you know, when they're laying awake at night, uh, when, they're quiet, when their mind is quiet, what comes to their head? You know, so helping them think about that um, dilemma and the ambivalence is really a critical part of what we do in motivational interviewing. So, for instance, traditionally, the traditional treatment um, for substance use disorders has been pretty much the abstinence model. Um, and for people who um, don't qualify or don't meet the criteria for that, the no problem uh, area, 
we do, again, the kind of primary prevention, the screening feedback, the, you know, drink responsibly, all those kinds of things. Well, what Espert has done for us is a very nice um, intervention, if you will, into the kind of areas where people don't often think about, and that is that excessive use. So I don't have a substance use disorder yet. Um, of course, I'm, I'm, I don't really quite fit the no problem area either. So what this does, Espert has brought into the conversation uh, the, uh, those folks who are having some difficulties, uh, may, they may not be to the tune of the, actually meeting the criteria for a substance use disorder, but at least we can start to talk about it and have a conversation around those that excessive use issue. So this is where we bring in brief intervention and brief treatment, that, the, the important part of that. And when we look at these areas of intervention need uh, in the, uh, the drinking behavior, if you will, uh, we look at, again, low risk or abstinence or, again, uh, treatment, if you will. But this harmful, uh, they begin to have some symptoms, uh, we do that, do that brief intervention. And this is where we can use uh, motivational interviewing very effectively. Of course, it's used in therapy uh, quite a little bit as well. So now I'm going to ask you a question, or I want you to think about this. Think about your own reactions to this, and that is um, resolving ambivalence. We have this thing called um, the writing reflex. And it's in particular, um, we, we have this built-in desire to set things right. Most of us do anyway. So we carry, you know, from the strength of conviction, it, it, it's very common. It's not something I want you to get rid of. It's just something I want you to think about. Uh, we, we, when th something's going wrong, we want to fix it. And especially when we see a discrepancy between what our client might be saying and what they're doing. So we, those are the kinds of things that we can point out. That is a very valuable thing that we're doing. But as helpers, we, we want to consider if this writing reflex might be um, putting the person on the defensive. So again, our goal here is to facilitate what we call self-directed change. So I'm going to ask you to think about what your writing reflex is. You know, what is, so, so now we have poll question number two, and I've got a few things up here on a list, but we'll, but we'll go ahead and have um, that poll question number two. So what is your writing reflex? Is it ordering, directing, persuading with logic or warning, giving advice, making suggestions, or providing the answer, agreeing, approving, or praising, interpreting, analyzing, reasoning, and sympathizing, or questioning and probing? Okay, I want to thank everybody for completing that poll. I'm going to share those results with you. So about 3% selected the first option, ordering, directing, persuading, logic, and warning. Uh, the majority selected interpreting, analyzing, reasoning, and sympathizing. That was about 43%. 29% uh, selected giving advice, making suggestions, or providing the answer. 20% selected question and pro questioning and probing. And 5% selected agreeing, approving, and praising. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, it's always good for us to kind of know what the kinds of things are, are happening for us inside of our conversations as well. And here's a list that includes, not, it includes all of those and a few more. They're just kind of ways that we might get in the way of a person's change. Uh, all of those things kind of intervene in a way that put people off, if you will. Now, of course, agreeing or praising and questioning and probing, those are things that we want you to be doing, of course. But I think we want to go about those in a way that, again, is not uh, it's listening to the patient, the client, and also um, reacting to that in a way that, again, doesn't have judgment. So what happens to us when it comes to this ambivalence or this writing reflex, we produce what we call discord. And it's that discord which we call the, the pushback. So when people are, um, when they're in discord, they're not, um, they're not happy with you and the relationship is at risk. 
So we want to pay attention to those areas that, that stop us from being able to have, you know, again, disagreement, disharmony, conflict with the, the, the target behavior, uh, the dissonance is distancing themselves away from us. So we want to just be using our um, smarts, if you will, or our, our self-assessment to think about what are the kinds of things that we're doing that kind of can put the person off. And again, discord is very difficult for us to address if we're not paying attention to that. So now I have this you know, thing about ambivalence up here, the two doors. And again, ambivalence is another area where if we're not paying attention, it's very easy for us to push a person through one of those doors. And you know they're going to hang on to the door jam and and and, and want to stop you from thinking. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What if I want to go the other way? So this ambivalence, if we push, will also get us that discord. Important for us to remember in that venue. Now I want to talk a little bit about sustained talk and um, think about uh, sustained talk and resistance, or the other side, if you will, of ambivalence. So where does what happens with that? Think about these statements as they come up. See this whole list, and I've got the D, A, R, N. Those are all desire, ability, reason, and need, as well as commitment, if you will. I guess I have to get up there. I'm not ready to make a change. Oops. I went back to smoking this week. So you want to think about statements like this as sustained talk. It's kind of like this is why the person is not changing. So identifying sustained talk in their conversation is a, is a, 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 a pretty important part of this. So when you think about what sustained talk actually is, let's think about it as a behavior or Again, it's an interpersonal inter, is an interaction. It takes two people to resist, which is why I say if you're feeling resistance, it's a time for you to examine what you may be doing to um, put energy to that resistance. Not that you're wrong, but if we're putting energy, helping to energize the resistance, that doesn't help us, of course, with, when, with our change agenda. Again, sustained talk, a signal of dissonance. Again, the person is distancing themselves from us and can be very predictive of non-change because what we do is we, as human beings, dig our feet in uh, when it comes to this idea of you can't make me change. So a little bit more on this is kind of like think about Star Wars, the big resistance against the Force. If you, I mean, I guess they guess that they have the Force, but Star Wars is kind of like they have to, it's a resistance movement. We're not going to buckle under, and that's kind of what happens. Um, uh, I don't know. I didn't really go to this, the new Star Wars movie, but if you think about the dialogue in those movies, it's kind of like we're not going to we're not going to let the big um, I don't know the Death Stars uh, take over our world. They're not going to change our way of life. So. Sustained talk is about the target behavior. It's about what's going on. But resistance is really about the relationship. And we want to think about that relationship and about how the person might uh, interpret what we have to say. Again, both of these are about the motivational interviewing style or those kinds of things that we call MI consistent behaviors uh, that's following the spirit, if you will. But again, thinking about predicting non-change, if that those things are going on, you're pretty sure that the person's feet are in the cement. And what I say, our job in motivational interviewing is to kind of loosen up that cement and try to get the person kind of foot wiggling out of that so that they can have a little bit of room to grow. So we have another poll question. And I'm going to let uh, Sarah take up that poll question, please. Okay, so what types of sustained talk do you encounter? Uh, about the target behavior, alcohol, tobacco, diet, or other examples. Uh, about the relationship, so you don't get me, or other. And again, if you select other, feel free to uh, explain in the questions box.
Okay, I want to thank everybody for completing that poll. I'm going to share those results. So the majority at 82% selected the target behavior, 14% selected the relationship, and 4% selected other. Uh, one person's comment in the questions box was friends and family. Okay. Um, and Kate, I do have three questions that have come in if you'd like to address those right now as well. Okay, so the first question is, how can motivational interviewing be used to encourage client participation in advocacy for community development? You know, I think that um, that's a particular area around uh, where the person's readiness level is and their confidence level is in regard to um, whatever that advocacy is. And so, uh, really, I think that this conversation about, you know, the importance of doing that on the, on the patient or client's part, on their confidence level uh, of, of their being able to do that, and then kind of working on self-efficacy, if you will, uh, in having that. So the conversation about change would be around those areas is where I would see without knowing the specific context. Next question. Okay. Uh, how effective is motivational interviewing for small group interventions? extremely effective. In fact, there's a nice book uh, that has been published just recently by Chris Wagner and Karen Ingersoll. And it's specific using motivational interviewing in groups. Uh, it's done very well. It's based on a number of uh, research studies as well. It's got um, good ha handouts or activities for you to do in group and how to use it in a group setting. Okay, and then the last question. Um, this attendee works in the hospital setting and is wondering if, for instance, a patient is identified in this setting, whether there's a resource to find other clinicians outside the hospital who are skilled in motivational interviewing. You know, that's a great question. And um, I think that there, there is a list on the Mint website of clinicians in uh, all across the United States uh, that are uh, able to address those kinds of things. Um, not everybody's been trained in it, of course, and um, if you're looking for a specific person, the best way to go about that is to get on the Mint website, motivationalinterviewing.org, and there's a question, you know, you, you can ask a question or you can take a look at the um, people in wherever your state or your location are, then you'll be able to make a connection some way. It may not be in your specific town, but Somebody from the Mint could uh, take a look at where those trainings may have been and they could make some inquiries for you. Okay, okay. and Kate, could you just reiterate the title of the book by Chris Wagner? Yes, it's, it's uh, Motivational Interviewing in Groups. Okay, and we'll be sharing all of these resources and some follow-up emails to the attendees as well. Thank you. All right. So here is a list of the different kinds of things that you can think about with sustained talk. Remember, we were thinking about fight, flight, or freeze behaviors, those kinds of things that stop us from actually moving ahead. So these are kinds of things you want to think about. If you're seeing these things, we're not saying their client is resistant. We're saying that they are examples of sustained talk for us to be aware of and to, again, think about how we're going to react to that. So if you take a look at this next slide here, where I've got some examples of both change talk and sustain talk, these might be coming again at the same time, but uh, it's, it's, again, something you want to take a look at. Um, so think about the, I really need to stop smoking because of the bad example I'm setting for my kids. And the sustained talk would be, I smoke outside and I really enjoy my time alone to smoke. I don't know what I'm going to do without it. So this is a, this is a sample of what can be uh, heard in the in some, in same conversation. And the same as the rest of these. You know, I've, I've started an exercise program and things are going well. But always in the past, I've gone back to being a couch potato when winter comes around. So we're hearing both sides of the conversation. Our job is to say something like, well, now that you've started your exercise program, 
what ways are you going to protect yourself from going back to the couch potato? So you, you bring in both kinds of things, but you stay more on the side of the change talk itself. Now, change talk, thinking about this again, ambivalence, that I want to change, but I don't want to change. These are the kinds of things that we're having our conversation with in motivational interviewing. So um, discussion about desirability, reasons, and need, as well as that commitment to change. How will I activate that change? And what are my next steps to do that? So if you think about the stages of change that I talked about earlier, um, these, these, these are some ways to match up our interventions with the stages of change. So if somebody got in pre-contemplation, I don't want to change at all. There are some strategies to use with that. Um, and Sarah, I'm thinking that this might be really hard for people to read on their um, small slides. So I can send this as a handout to you and we can send it to the participants if that would be helpful. Absolutely. All right, I'll, I'll do that as soon as we finish. All right. So if you can take a look at the, the next one, contemplation. Pre one and two are the areas that we're going to see most of our work in motivational interviewing. Uh, three, you're going to maybe see a little bit of it as well. But once a person gets four, five, and four and five, we don't need motivational interviewing. But it can come back into the picture if these behaviors reoccur. So this is a way of thinking about the stages of change. But they can be really helpful for us in, in putting our intervention in place, uh, our motivational interviewing intervention in place related to that. So we'll send that out. So our basics here to think about are we want to focus on the behavior change. Think about the style and spirit of how we're doing that. Asking our open-ended questions. Making sure that we are aware of the importance of affirming the client's strengths and change efforts that have happened in the past. Making reflective statements, but making those, again, in a direction and making what we call the difference between simple versus complex. Fostering of this collaborative atmosphere, again, personal choice. When personal choice is taken away from someone, it's very hard for them to feel comfortable or confident that they can put um, a, a change agenda out there or talk with you about change because they feel pushed when that happens. And think about yourself when you feel that, how you might react when somebody tells you you don't have any personal choice. So autonomy is, is critical. And then, of course, practice. And I might say practice, practice, practice because it's really um, an area that is um, Again, getting our skills up together with that, if you don't practice and have some feedback from somebody outside of yourself, it's kind of difficult to see if you're making progress. So when I talk about questions, again, oftentimes this can put us back in that expert uh, role. We really want to try to stay out of that as much. Yes, we have expertise, but we don't need to be the expert. So again, too many questions. It gets us into the question and answer trap. One after another. You know, we're trying to solve our curiosity rather than think about being curious about the client's perspective. Um, and oftentimes, the difference between open and closed questions are going to really, you know, help you with um, a better conversation. What happens when you're asking so many questions? Your client doesn't have to really do anything. They become passive. So we have that question and answer trap that we really want to be careful about. And um, I, I found this earlier, and I love this. It's kind of like the, the, we, we've knocked them down with too many questions. They're not involved in the conversation anymore because they're just waiting for us to ask some more questions so they don't have to think or work on it. Affirmation. Again, this is a thing, again, affirming the client in an authentic way. Compliments, again, with a direction. What they've done in terms of movement toward a goal, affirm a completion of a goal. If you're doing this, then this really helps us to move the client in the new direction. So in terms of reflections, 
here's some different kinds of things you can think about with reflections. You can reflect speech. You know, how is the person talking? Are they rapid speech? Are they feeling? Ex are they excitable? What are their facial expressions telling you? What behaviors are they uh, having right now? Those are reflections that you can have. And again, we we want to make this what we call a therapeutic hunch, if you will. So you're making a guess about the deeper meaning of what might be going on. So if a person's frowning, you can look at them and say, you're really worried. Now they might say, no, I'm not really worried. I've got an earache. So again, we're checking it out. This, this hunch is that we're, we're making a statement that's about a hunch. So a reflection, again, can be um, uh, somewhat complex and, and very helpful. So here's a level of reflective listening skills. So we talk about repeating what the client says or rephrasing it. These are called simple reflections. We have complex reflections, which is inferring different meaning as a paraphrase or reflecting of feelings, um, uh, the, uh, the addition of the emotional dimension that the person might be having. We call those complex because we're adding meaning you can use metaphors, but you're amplifying it. Sometimes you're doing things like uh, double-sided reflection, talking about both sides. So you really want to stop smoking, but you're not sure what you're going to do to get that important alone time away from your kids if you give up smoking. So again, this is looking at both sides of the dilemma that the client's presenting to you and then stating that. Now, the more advanced skills are overshooting and undershooting. And we're not going to talk about that in this webinar again, but, but it's important for us to think about, are we just doing simple reflections, or can we pump up the volume, if you will, in our reflective skills? And then summarizing is really, you know, I, I think that affirmations and summarizing are a lot about reflections also. So summarizing is a special form of reflection. This is, again, where you choose to summarize specific things around change. Muted. Views that I've talked about today are, again, importance and confidence ruler. What's the best and worst case scenario? So querying extremes. Looking to the person's past about what they've done in the past to be successful. What would they like to do in the future to, uh, to, to, to make this change happen? Again, evocative questions. I talked a little bit about the decisional balance piece. Bringing in the client's goals and values. And then elaborating uh, about you know, what are they saying to you. So here are some things to think about when you're using motivational interviewing. One, slow down. Uh, we don't need to go too fast. Sometimes we feel pushed to do that, but it's really important for us to just kind of uh, take, take stock and see what we're doing. Give the participant time enough to respond. Think about what they're saying so that you don't miss the point. Again, if you're trying to do too much at, at one time, you're going to get you're going to get messed up with this. Um, we don't want to come across as blaming the client in any way, and then we want to. We want to provide solutions after we've listened to the client's problem. Here's some things that might help. Be really clear about any constraints that you have. So what might be going on um, if you're working with probation, for instance? You're kind of serving two masters, the client and the probation system. So be clear about that. Uh, understanding and honoring cultural perspectives. Again. Demonstrating this non-judgmental way of being, if you will, and then having some kind of agreement on a, any small change. So as we move kind of toward the close, again, we want to think about this again. Having conversations about change is really what motivational interviewing is about. So I want to ask Sarah any questions that we have as we close. Uh, we do have one question here. Um, if the therapists have weight issues or other issues that are similar to the client, how does this impact motivational interviewing for change to reduce weight? Um, or that could be applied to other examples. Sure. 
Um, I think it does apply, and I think that we all, as human beings, have our own struggles. And we it, it's not like I have had to have a broken leg to fix a broken leg, you know, if I, if I have the training and that kind of thing. But again, it's a conversation about change. So relating back to, you know, if I'm not successful in my own um, weight loss plan and I'm trying to do this with somebody else, it, I suppose it depends on the person that you're working with. It may impact that and it may not. Um, but I don't think it stops anybody from having those conversations about change. Uh, uh, again, I don't have to be a recovering alcoholic to help people get into recovery. It's helpful if I'm not drinking, especially when I'm working with them. <laughs> uh, again, we don't, we don't, again, we don't want to have displays of um, the opposite behavior if we can help it. But I don't think everybody's, you know, I think we have to think about people are human beings. Okay, well thanks so much Kate, that was an excellent webinar.